Welcome everybody to RSSL's webinar on Natasha's Law, uh, the new allergen legislation for pre-packed for direct sale, so we'll, we'll use the term PPDS foods. Today we wanted to update you on the requirements and the implications this now brings for the industry. So Jessica Sage and Barbara Hurst will be delivering the technical content of the webinar this morning and I will be here to support them. My name is Emma Bridges and I'm the Senior Account Manager within our commercial team. Jessica is a consultant and Barbara a Senior Consultant within our Food Safety and Quality Consultancy team. The team have much experience supporting our clients with projects related to the control and labelling of allergens. So before we get started, let's just share with you some information in case you are having any technical issues and also if you wish to pose a question as the team are presenting. For any technical issues that you are having, please send a short message within the question chat box on the right hand side of your screen. The team here will then respond to you directly in order to try and resolve your issue. Whilst Jess and Barbara are presenting, if you have any questions you wish to ask, please feel free to submit these using the questions box on the right hand side of your screen as we go along. We will then collate these and do our best to answer questions at the end of the formal presentation. Okay, so now all the admin has been start sorted, let's proceed with the webinar. And let me start by telling you a little more about RSSL so you can understand why we're able to share our knowledge with you today. So RSSL has supported the global food industry with a broad range of services since 1987. We work for many of the top global companies as well as small startups and small to medium enterprises. Our UCAS accredited facility in Reading is where our team of 330 staff are based and our technical expertise covers a broad range of services which include chemistry, physical sciences, biochemistry, as well as food technology. One of our key strengths is our multidisciplinary teams available to support client needs to support with the whole product lifecycle. Our emergency response service ensures priority access to laboratories 24 seven to support projects which are time critical, such as resolving customer complaints or manufacturing issues. Our expertise as a business is extremely broad. We provide a number of product and contaminant analytical services, including those used for claim substantiation, which include product authenticity analysis and free from claims. We also have a number of services which can support with the resolution of manufacturing issues or consumer complaints, such as foreign body identification, um, as well as a full suite of physical and structural characterization services. We provide an extensive range of product development services from both food technologists working on the bench to developing and optimizing recipes through to analytical support for your internal internal MPD teams. Our training and consultancy support is very manufacturing focused, including allergen management, and it is this expertise that we are sharing with you today. So this slide covers all the services we provide to support the industry with allergen management. This includes finished product and ingredient testing, cleaning validation and verification studies. We also provide allergen management technical consultancy for food manufacturers, hotels, restaurants and shops. In addition, we support with bespoke factory based allergen workshops, as well as tailored training for everybody involved in the distribution and serving of foods. Our bespoke workshops include gap analysis against best practice and assessment of contamination risks and incident root cause investigations. So I will now hand over to Jess to present what the requirements for PPDS foods were before the new legislation was introduced. She will then talk about how and why the change to the requirements has come about before talking through what the new requirements are under Natasha's law. Next, bye. Barbara will spend some time firstly talking through what PPDS foods actually are and how they are being defined. She will give some examples of what does and doesn't fall into the category and then she will talk through some of the implications and challenges that businesses are facing. We will then have some time for questions afterwards. So over to you Jess. Wonderful, thank you very much Emma. Okay so before we get into the detail of what Natasha's law is all about and what it means for prepat for direct sale foods, we thought it was important to first talk about what the requirements around allergen information were before the change was made. 
as I think this helps us to understand why it's come about and, and how we've got to where we are today. Uh, it's also important to note at this point that Natasha's law is not just about declaring allergens, but as this was one of the main drivers for the change, that is primarily what we are focusing on today. Okay, next slide, please, Emma. Wonderful, thank you. So, as I said, to understand where we've got to today, it's important to understand where we were before. Now, for many years, uh, it's been a legal requirement that the 14 allergens defined in legislation are declared when they are present as deliberate ingredients in pre-packed foods. Now, those 14 allergens were decided at a European level based on the numbers of people with allergies to those foods and also the known severities of those reactions. So prior to 2014, there was no specific requirement for food sold loose or foods sold as this term pre-packed for direct sale to have information about the allergens they contained provided along with them. But what we were seeing, however, was that the large proportion of serious allergic reactions and allergy related fatalities were happening in people who were eating away from home. So eating those types of foods, food sold loose, food sold pre-packed for direct sale. So this was one of the main drivers for the change in the requirements around allergen information. Now, the Food Information to Consumers Regulation came into force in 2014, and this then stipulated that allergen information should be available in all eating situations, including restaurants, deli counters, canteens, kebab vans, uh, food sold via distance selling, and it also then covered these foods sold pre-packed for direct sale. Now, what what may have been confusing and what still is causing a little bit of confusion. So at that time, food sold loose was relatively easy to understand what that meant. So there was no packaging associated with that food when it was sold. Prepack for direct sale was not very well defined. And it could be argued that it was, it was confusing that the requirements for prepack for direct sale foods were more closely associated with food sold loose, even though by definition, there is packaging associated with the food. So that, that was potentially an area of confusion at that time. Next slide, please, Emma. Thank you. So um, after the regulation was enforced uh, back in 2014, what the FSA did was they published some guidance to help businesses to comply with the new requirements. Now, prepack for direct sale or PPDS was not defined in the regulation. So what the FSA tried to do was to, to help define this a little bit more. And how they defined it in their technical guidance was as foods packed on the same premises from which they are being sold. And they provided some examples. Uh, such as meals pre-packed in a canteen for consumption on or off the premises, or bread or pies sold at bakeries. For these types of foods, the requirements for providing allergen information were the same as for food sold loose. Although these foods, however, were being sold in packaging, by definition, allergens did not need to be labelled on that packaging. However, the information needed to be available and easily accessible to the consumer. If the information was not being provided upfront, then there needed to be signage to inform the customer how they could obtain the information. A business had the option of providing the information in written form or orally, but however it was provided, it needed to be accurate and verifiable. These requirements as I said, were in line with those for food sold loose, which again, it could be argued as being confusing as clearly by definition, these foods are being sold in some form of packaging. Next slide, please. So a couple of years after the Food Information to Consumers Regulation was introduced, very sadly, uh, Natasha Ednan Laperouse um, died 
following allergic, an allergic reaction to a baguette that she purchased from Pret-a-Manger at Heathrow Airport. Natasha had a diagnosed allergy to sesame, and very sadly, she did not realize that when she bought the baguette, that it contained sesame as a deliberate ingredient within the dough. The baguette was packed on the same premises from which it was sold, and it therefore fell under the category of PPDS food, meaning there was no requirement for allergens to be declared on the packaging. Natasha's father, who was with her at the time, has since stated that they were given a false sense of security by the description of the baguette, which did not mention sesame. Signposting was used in the store to tell customers to ask if they needed allergen information, but it was questioned whether this was clear enough. The coroner's report also questioned whether larger businesses should be exempted from providing allergen information about their products. Next slide, please. So following Natasha's death, her parents began to campaign for a change in the law. And this was supported by Michael Gove, who was the Environment Secretary at that time. The FSA then launched a consultation, which was open to both industry and the public. And within this, they set out a number of options, which ranged from promotion of best practices through to full ingredient listing with allergens emphasized. Now, the result of the consultation was that the overwhelming majority of respondents felt that full ingredient listing with all allergens emphasized was the best option for prepack for direct sale foods. Interesting to note here is that the voting was not weighted in any way, and so individual members of the public, whole businesses, and votes from industry bodies representing multiple businesses all carried the same level of influence. Next slide, please. So following the consultation, a new statutory instrument was laid, which set out the new requirements for labelling of prepat for direct sale foods. And as we are all aware, I'm sure these are due to be enforced from the 1st of October this year. So the new requirements are that foods that fall into this category must be labelled with the name of the food and a full ingredients list. As with prepat foods, the ingredient list should be in descending order of weight and all compound ingredients must have their individual ingredients also listed. Now, this is just a summary of what those requirements are. If you need more specific information um, about things like font size and things like that, then we uh, strongly recommend that you consult with the FSA. Uh, the FSA's website has lots of information available on those specific requirements. So allergens, that are present as uh, intentional ingredients from the de declarable list of 14 must be listed in the ingredients list. And they must also be emphasized in some way so they, that they stand out. And this can be through the use of a different font, emboldening in some way, or highlighting um, the text in some way. And this should be done every time they appear in the ingredients list, so not just the first time. Handwritten labels are permitted, but they must still meet all of the requirements, such as the specific font size and the emphasizing, et cetera, which could be quite difficult um, to do. And businesses that are using printed labels are encouraged to make sure they have some kind of backup plan in case their printer fails. So if they do need to then resort to using handwritten labels, they must be prepared um, to be able to do that. The precautionary statements where allergens may be present unintentionally, these can go on the label or they can be given verbally. The FSA has been very clear though that warnings from suppliers should be passed on to the consumer. Okay, next slide please. So that was a very quick summary of where we were and where we are now and the changes that are about to be enforced. But we're very aware that this change presents a lot of challenges to businesses and it may not be easy for some to adapt to. One of the biggest challenges is actually understanding which foods fall into the category of prepack for direct sale. So we're going to spend a lot more time now thinking about that and what does and what does not fall into that category. Um, I think this hasn't really been helped by the fact that there, there was no def definition for PPDS previously, 
Um, however, the FSA have updated their technical guidance, so there is a lot more information in there now to try and help businesses to understand what PPDS means, <clears throat> excuse me, and whether their their foods fall into that category. They've also developed a decision tree um, that, that should help businesses to decide. Another challenge is the practicalities of doing this. So from investing in label printers to ensuring the right label goes on every single time, this has been a massive change for businesses and could potentially hugely affect how they serve their customers. And some may actually have to move away from offering PPDS foods altogether because it's just too difficult for them to introduce these these labels and in turn that could massively affect how efficiently that that business runs um, being such a big change it's important that team members are aware of it particularly because their customers expectations are going to shift massively and we know from the pre-packed food sector that mistakes re relating to packing and labeling of food are common and so procedures will need to be in place and trained out to minimize the risks of mislabeling of these foods. The business will need to be confident that any changes to recipes or to supplied ingredients will be highlighted in some way so that the labels can then be updated accordingly to make sure they are accurate. And deciding how to communicate risks to customers will also be important. Now the customer is being given more information about the food they are buying, they are potentially less likely to have a conversation with the staff or whoever they're purchasing, purchasing the food from um, to make them aware that they have an allergy. So is it possible then that, that warnings might be missed? Now, the FSA are very keen to stress to businesses that if they are struggling, if they are unsure um, of what they should be doing, they, they should be reaching out um, and, and getting support. And they've also developed an online portal with sector specific guidance that they're encouraging people to look at. Also, they have Safer Food for Better Business, um, uh, the toolkit, which is available through their website, which again um, provides businesses with advice on how to manage allergens in uh, a kitchen environment. So they, they're very keen to, to stress that businesses should be looking to, the, to their website for support. Okay, so with that, I think I'll now be handing over to Barbara, who's going to spend a, a lot of time looking at examples of what prepared for direct sale foods actually are. Thanks very much indeed, Jess. Hope everyone can hear. As Jess says, that was a, a really comprehensive, I think, overview as to where we were, why the change has happened and where we are now. So what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on now, as I said, is some examples of prepack for direct sale, and then also think about some of the implications and challenges, both for businesses and also consumers. So let's start off here with a definition of prepack for direct sale. And what we're going to do is try and unpick some of the language within the definition. So pre-packed for direct sale food is food that is packaged at the same place it is offered or sold to consumers. It is a single item consisting of the food and its packaging that is ready for presentation to the consumer before it is ordered or selected. So let's just unpick some of those things. So the food is packaged at the same place. It does not need to be prepared at the same place, but it does need to be packaged. When we think about the same place, what do we mean by that? The same place also means the same business. So, for example, food that's sold by a mobile vendor or market sellers packed by the same business at another location is also PPDS food. So, for example, if you were in a shopping centre, an airport, a train station where you had a hub where food was may be prepared but packaged certainly and then distributed within that wider site that would also be considered the same place. When we think about the food and its packaging what do we mean by some of that? Examples of packaging are things like a cake completely wrapped in cling film, a sandwich that's maybe placed in a paper bag with the bag folded over or twisted to encase it, Rolls contained in a plastic bag that are tied with a knot or sealed. 
just be clear as well that when we're thinking about foods that a consumer selects themselves, this is what is covered under this, but it's also covering products that are kept behind the counter so the person isn't actually directly picking them up, they're still being served them. It also covers some food sold at mobile or temporary outlets. And that offered or sold bit is interesting. So it includes food that is given away where there is no money exchanging hands or clearly where it's sold, where there is a, a monetary transaction. It covers both of those scenarios. Be careful as well that if a consumer is selecting foods that are displayed as loose on a tray, but what you're actually selling them is packaged and it was in a package at the point that they are selecting it, even though they're selecting it from a visually loose tray, that food is also pre-packed for direct sale. So when we're thinking about package, as I say, it's got to be the food's either got to be fully or partially enclosed by the packaging. The food cannot be altered without opening or changing the packaging and the food has to be ready for sale to the consumer. And we're going to come through some examples with those in the coming slides. Be careful with things like small sauce pots. If the largest surface area of the packaging is less than 10 centimetres squared, you don't have to produce a PPDS label with all the ingredients in the allergens emphasised because it's not practical and you can't fit it with the font size. So if you don't produce a full label, you must still make the ingredients information available in some form, for example, either verbally or in writing that is not on the packaging. Mandatory allergen information must still be on the label as a contains statement. Of course, if the largest surface area is more than 10 centimetres squared, then it will require PPDS labelling. So we've thought about what is PPDS. Let's also think about what is not PPDS. And obviously by the opposite, it's any food that is not in packaging or is packaged after it's been ordered by the consumer. So these are types of non-prepacked food and don't require a label with the name, the ingredients and the allergens emphasised. But of course, the allergen information must still be provided. But this can be done through other means, and that includes orally. So it is not PPDS food if it doesn't have any packaging or if it's packaged in a way that the food can be altered without opening or changing the packaging. An example of that would be, for example, a burger that's served on an open cardboard tray. If food is packed by one business and supplied to another business, then that is pre-packed food and already must have the full labelling. So nothing has changed with regard to that kind of food. And that full labelling must include the name of the food and a full ingredients list with the allergenic ingredients emphasised within it. This new labelling requirements do not apply to foods that have been sold by means of distant selling. So that includes food that's purchased over the telephone, on the internet or through an app. So it doesn't cover those. But of course, remember, if you're selling food through distance selling, then you must still provide the allergen information, both before the purchase of the food is completed. It can be in writing, on a website, on a menu, or it can be orally by telephone. And you must also provide it when the food is delivered. Again, this can be in writing. You can have allergen stickers on the food or maybe an enclosed copy of the menu, where it again can be done orally. The allergen information should be available to a customer in writing form at a point somewhere between the customer's placing the order and taking delivery of it. And of course, it's really important to think about takeaway meals need to be labelled so that can, customers can actually identify to know which dishes it was that they actually ordered. OK, so let's talk through some examples here. And as Jess mentioned, so the Food Standards Agency, they have a dedicated site to prepack for direct sale and they have a decision tree toolkit, which hopefully will help guide you as to whether a food that you're selling is PPDS or not. They've also given some examples for different food business scenarios. And we're actually going to talk through some of these because it can be quite complicated figuring out whether something is indeed prepacked for direct sale or not. So we're going to start with the kind of bakery cafe type scenarios. 
So let's imagine we're in a bakery and bread is displayed behind the counter as loaves of bread. There's no packaging on them. And I go in and I select a loaf of bread and then it's packed after I've made that selection. That is not pre-packed for direct sale. If a baguette is offered in an open ended paper bag like we have in one of the middle pictures here, that is also not PPDS. If a baguette was being offered, however, in a paper bag where the end has been folded or twisted, that puts it into the pre pack for direct sale category. If you have a baguette with a watch strap, so the baguette is essentially open and it's just a piece of card that kind of fits around the middle and is attached, that is not pre pack for direct sale. Think about an interesting scenario here. So I'm in a bakery. And the bakery has chosen to pre-package packets of donuts in packets of four. And they're in a twisted paper bag. That clearly would be PPDS if I came in and I bought my packet of four donuts. But imagine on one day I want to come in and I need an extra donut because I've got an extra friend that day. And I'm picking those donuts from an open tray. And the server is then putting them into a bag for me after I've ordered them that would not be pre-packed for direct sale and would not require the full ingredients listing. Something I'm seeing a lot more of now, and I think it might be partly COVID related, is you're seeing quite a lot of single bakery items like croissants or Danish pastries that have been placed into a simple heat sealed bag in order to keep them fresh. By putting them in a heat sealed bag before the customer is selecting them, that puts them into the pre-packed for direct sale category. Okay, let's think about cakes. Um, if a cake, a whole cake, is bought in by the bakery and sold as they bought it, that's pre-packed food. That will come with the full ingredients listing and you're passing that on to the customer. If you've bought a cake in and then you're slicing it for serving, if a slice is packed by the bakery into a box before the customer selects it, that would be pre-packed for direct sale. But if the slice is offered, say, on an open plate when it's chosen and it's not packed, that would not be pre-packed for direct sale. That would be food sold loose. If you had a cake that was presented under a plastic dome where the whole of that cake and the dome is presented to the customer and they buy as a whole, then that would be pre-packed for direct sale. But as we have in the picture here, if you had a cake under a dome, if they were to buy the whole cake, but the cake is repacked when it's taken from the dome, put into packaging to take away, that's not pre-packed for direct sale. And clearly, if then it's sliced and after choosing and then it's packed afterwards, that's also not pre-packed for direct sale. Let's cover some questions around panini. So if a panini is packaged, fully encased before I choose it, I can clearly see what ingredients um, and what allergens might be present. But I'm likely then to hand it over to a server for heating and maybe for something extra to be added to it. The guidance here is that if something is added to it, that extra information must be provided when it's handed back. But that, in fact, can be done orally. Soup is an interesting one. So sometimes you'll be in a bakery type or cafe type scenario where soup may have already been pre put into a pot on the premises before I'm choosing it. And it might be in the pot before I choose it. That would be pre packed for direct sale. But if the pot was empty and I had to take it to the counter and that was then served from a terrain into the pot, that's not pre packed for direct sale. Sandwiches, of course, if they are in a packet and that is fully enclosed before I'm choosing it, that clearly is pre-packed for direct sale. OK, let's look at some of these other kind of scenarios. So butchers and farmers markets and mobile stalls. So butchers, it's quite common, of course, now to see that some of the items will be packed on the premises by the butcher before the customer selects them. So sausages in a tray covered in cling film, for example, would be pre-packed for direct sale. Clearly, however, if I walk in and I see the open tray sausages and they are selected from the open tray by the butcher and they're packed for me, then they're not pre-packed for direct sale. Of course, if the butcher is doing anything to me, for example, adding 
a marinade or a sauce to it and then packaging it. Don't forget, of course, that it will require the full ingredients and allergens for all those extra things you've added to it. That is not unique to butchers, of course. It's true for any food sold pre packed for direct sale. But for me, it's quite an interesting one just to consider. When we think about a farmer's market and maybe food having come from a butcher, if the meat has been sold by a farmer at a farmer's market and it was packed at the farm before going to the stall, in other words, by the same business, that would be pre-packed for direct sale. But if the food being sold at the market has been both packed and prepared maybe by a different business, that would be pre-packed food and would have to require full labelling as it would have done beforehand. A mobile store, so if it's being packed from the same business but at a different location, for example, before you left home, if it was made at that home as a food business, that will still be pre-packed for direct sale. It's clear that if you're in the scenario where you're maybe having a one-off for charity, so a cake bake sale for charity, for example, that's excluded from these requirements as it was under Food Information for Consumers Regulation. If you're a cafe and maybe making food to sell at a mobile store at a fair and it's packed at the cafe before you arrive at the fair, that will be pre-packed for direct sale. OK, let's think about some of the scenarios where we're talking about fast food type takeaway environments, buffets and school trip provision. So if you were an event caterer or a stall, and let's imagine pizza is the thing that you're selling. There are lots of different scenarios for this kind of thing. So if pizza is sold and it's already in the box before the customer selects it, then that would be pre-packed for direct sale. But if the pizza was sold by the slice on an open plate, that's not pre-packed for direct sale. And be really clear about this. If you were in the scenario where food was being given away, but it was still pre-packed perhaps into a small box, it's still pre-packed for direct sale because that definition, although the word sale I think can be a bit confusing, it is sold or offered. So money does not need to change hands. So if you're in any scenario where something is pre-packed before the customer's selecting it, whether you're selling it or giving it away, it will still be PPDS. Now, distance selling, as we mentioned earlier, is not pre-packed for direct sale. But again, remember that the information must be provided both before it's ordered and at the point of delivery. The FSA has some good examples around the kind of fast food, because I think there are lots of scenarios where we might be used to seeing people anticipating a rush. So having, for example, burgers already prepared and wrapped in paper, that would be pre-packed for direct sale. Or let's say a box of chicken nuggets, if they're wrapped or put in a box before they've been selected, that would be pre-packed for direct sale. But if I came in and the burger was made to order as I was ordering it, that's not pre-packed for direct sale. Remember about that scenario I was mentioning earlier about small pots of sauces. If they're put into the pot before they're choosing them, then they do need to have a contains label for allergens. Remember what I said before. Candy floss. Imagine you're a stall at a fair. If you look at the picture on the bottom right, if you've made some candy floss and you've put it into some kind of a plastic tub before it's chosen, that will be pre-packed for direct sale. But if it's made fresh, as in the picture in the top right, that would not be pre-packed for direct sale. Buffets, we're all used to, we understand what a buffet um, selection is. So if it's an open salad bar, it's clearly not pre-packed for direct sale. That's food sold loose. But if, for example, they've chosen to put some salads in a plastic pot or maybe, you know, um, a small selection of chopped fruit in a pot, that would be pre-packed for direct sale. And I think that's partly COVID um, influenced, if I'm honest, that you see more of that happening these days. Things like prawn crackers, it's interesting, again, it's pre-packed for direct sale if they're in the bag already before they're selected. But if they're ordered online or over the phone, of course, that comes under the distance selling. So that would not be pre-packed for direct sale. 
Sushi is another interesting one. So if sushi is offered, and you often see these on a conveyor, if it's offered and it's on a plate with a dome over it, that would be prepat for direct sale. If it's offered as a single item under the dome and it's presented to the consumer with the dome, then it's PPDS. If, however, it's served to you and the dome is removed before it's handing o handed over, that would not be prepat for direct sale. Okay, school trips. So imagine um, your child is going on a school trip. If the lunches are made in advance, obviously, and packed to a specific order, it would not be prepacked for direct sale because the students have chosen what they wanted and they will be individually provided and labelled for each student. However, if they're made without a specific order, so let's imagine the school kitchen makes up some tuna sandwiches, makes up some egg sandwiches, makes up some cheese sandwiches, puts them all in cardboard skillets. So they're not intended for specific children. The children can choose them maybe while they're on the trip. That would be prepacked for direct sale. So I hope you've managed to follow that. Um, and what we're going to look at now are some of the implications and challenges for that. So both for businesses and consumers. And clearly, one of the big first challenges is you need to decide if the food you're selling is either prepacked, prepacked for direct sale, or food sold loose. And it's likely that you may well have a combination of two or three of these. So you really need to be ready. And it might change during the day especially if you're anticipating a rush, you might make some prepack for direct sale foods. Some businesses may choose, in fact, to unify their offering. And we are seeing quite a lot of that as we're out and about. So either removing the prepack for direct sale offering that they had before, or they're ensuring that all the foods that they sell are prepack for direct sale. And that maybe is just to make it easier and simpler. Some, business are, some businesses are choosing to over-label non pre for direct sale foods. And it's maybe where they have a mixture. They just want to get everything ready. They want everything to be labeled even when it doesn't need to be. And I understand why. That can be maybe simpler for the business. It could definitely be easier maybe and better for the consumer. But one of the implications of doing that is if consumers shop in those kinds of environments where non pre for direct sale foods are labelled, if they go into a different store where that isn't happening, consumers may expect to have seen labelling and they may make assumptions. And that's something I must admit I have quite a concern over. Clearly, you need to be able to collate all the ingredients information that you're going to have to be able to prepare your labels. And you need to manage those changes that you might have either to supplied ingredients or if you have to buy and use, for example, a different ingredient like a different mayonnaise in a sandwich. Of course, that could change the ingredients and the allergens. And I know that there are some software packages available to help that kind of ingredient collation. Clearly, you're going to have to invest in print capability if you're selling PPDS. And you need to also be ready and consider what are you going to do if the printer breaks? So what we do know is that handwritten labels are acceptable, but they must still meet the requirements for font size and legibility. Now, precautionary allergen labeling. This is one of the, the difficult areas, I think it's fair to say. Um, now, the Food Standards Agency are very clear that any precautionary allergen labelling that might come in from an ingredient that you've bought, let's say, for example, that mayonnaise that you're using in the sandwich, that must be passed on to a consumer. The FSA then expect businesses, of course, in the kind of catering sector, that they have to make an assessment of any risks that might arise from the preparation of the food. They must do a meaningful risk assessment. And only if there is a significant and real risk still present, then a precautionary allergen label must be applied. I've mentioned here about the COVID effect purely because we're seeing 
some businesses are choosing to reduce, for example, the buffet choices, and they're doing some of this pre-packing maybe of salads or fruit pots. Of course, just be aware that that may then put them into the pre-pack for direct sale category. Even if, remember you're in the scenario, I don't know, you're on a cruise ship or something where you're not directly selling the food, but you are still offering it, that would still make it pre-packed for direct sale. And we're seeing some businesses, as I mentioned earlier, packing items in simple heat sealed bags for freshness or for hygiene reasons. Again, this could be PPDS. I think one of the biggest areas um, that concerns me in this is consumer communication. As more and more information is provided to the consumer, and of course that is what this whole new law is about, consumers may then be less inclined to engage in a conversation with the person who's serving the food to them about any potential risks. And that does worry me. Um, when we're thinking about information, we can learn from the pre-packed food sectors. And we know that the biggest risks, it's all about the dose of the allergen a consumer might get. The biggest risks are providing the wrong information on the label. Consumer will not know that that's happened. Providing the consumer with the wrong product in the packet, well, a consumer might notice that and not eat it if it looks very different to something they're expecting. Or providing the product with an incorrect ingredient. It's unlikely a consumer will know if that has happened. And these are the biggest risks because the dose of the allergen that allergic consumer might receive could be quite high. So as a business, if you are selling pre-pack for direct sale foods, you really need to think about how any risks from undeclared allergens are going to be A, displayed. That's clear. You have choices about how you can do it. You can provide it on the label with the pre-pack for direct sale. You can provide it orally or it can be provided with a site notice. But also think about how that might be interpreted by consumers. And I've just come up with a few examples here. If you label a food as vegan, a consumer may assume that it is automatically free from egg, milk, fish, crustaceans and mollusks. So if it isn't and there is a risk, you need to be making sure that's clearly displayed. If you're choosing to provide this information orally about the precautionary labelling, do you positively ask consumers if they have any allergies or intolerances? And if they reply yes, how are you then engaging that or furthering that conversation? If a consumer comes in and says, can you guarantee that X, Y or Z is going to be safe for me? How are you going to manage that kind of situation? And if your labels don't mention any additional risks, will consumers maybe assume that that is equivalent to free from? If the precautionary label isn't prominent, could consumers assume again risk free? And I mentioned this before here is if a business is choosing to over label non pre packed for direct sale foods, could consumers assume allergens are not present in another business that only labels pre packed for direct sale food? And, you know, this whole new law is designed to make consumers safer, provide them with more comprehensive information. So we must all work together really and accept both of business responsibilities, but also allergic consumers still have a responsibility to engage, communicate and check. And this new law certainly does not remove all the risks. So just to wrap up here before we move on to any questions that have come in, and it looks like we've had several. Um, these new requirements for foods classed as PPDS are going to be enforced from October the 1st this year, where a full ingredient listing will be required and the allergens must be emphasised. The Food Standards Agency have developed the online support decision tree and they've got lots of examples there to try and help guide you to figure out whether you're selling or offering PPDS foods or not. But there are some clear implications both for businesses and consumers. Um, and there are going to pose some challenges here, and we're all going to have to navigate these together. Thank you. Thank you both to Jess and Barbara for that great overview regarding the new requirements related to allergen information for foods sold pre-packed for direct sale. So thank you to all those attendees who have asked some questions. As Barbara said, we've got a few that have come through. Um, so we'll just start to work through 
some of them now. Now, I've noticed that there were a couple about on-site canteens um, and people wanted clarification around um, do the products on their canteen or in their canteens fall under the PPDS category. So, um, Barbara, would you like to start? Yes, as I said, I think um, the prepack for direct sale bit, the word sale is a bit misleading. Even if you're giving the food away, it doesn't matter. If it's been packed before the person is selecting it um, from the same site, then it will be PPDS. It doesn't, money doesn't directly have to change hands. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the next one that we've had, how do you envisage giving precautionary warnings verbally if the customer is selecting from a shelf rather than asking staff? Is a sign suggesting they should ask good enough? That's a great question. Um, and I think it's a really difficult one, to be honest. And I and I don't know how businesses are going to going to navigate this. Um, because, of course, if a customer is selecting from a shelf, there doesn't need to be any interaction. They can pick it up from the shelf. They hand it over. You know, they do the tap with the card and they don't have to speak to anybody. Um, so a sign suggesting that they should ask, is it good enough, is the question. Yes, it would be good enough under Natasha's law. But is it going to be sufficient? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I wonder, Jess, whether you have any comments on that. Yes, I guess uh, it is. It's an interesting one, and it is going to be difficult, as as we've said. The concern is that the more information the customer has on the packaging, the less likely they are to then actually have a conversation with guys working in in the shop or on the premises. So, and also, you know, this this was essentially the system beforehand was the sign posting, telling people to ask for the information. That that was where we were. And we still saw um, incidents happening. So, yeah, it's it is going to be a difficult one for businesses to to navigate what what the best way to do it will be. Thank you, Jess. Um, another one that's um, come through. Um, we serve salad as and when the customer orders it. Sometimes in the morning for lunch, and sometimes order at the counter for lunch, but is packed in the back kitchen room out of the fridge. Uh, would this still be classed as not PPDS or PPDS? Yet another great question. And I think, and I'm going to ask Jess for just to just to check with me here, it all matters at what point it is packed. So if it's been packed before the customer chooses it, whether or not the customer can see that it's packed, it would be PPDS. If, however, the customer says, please, can I have a green salad and you go to the back and you put it in a pot and then deliver it to the customer, then it would not be pre packed for direct sale. Jess, do you agree? Yes, absolutely agree. It's all about when it's packed. So, yeah, as you said, Barbara, yes. if it's packed before they order it, then PPDS. But by the sounds of it, if, if you're making up the salad after they order it, or packing it after they've ordered it, then no, that would not be PPDS. Thank you. Um, another one that's just come through. <clears throat> if a chef puts condiments, for example, ketchup, into a ramekin that is less than 10 centimetres in diameter, but covers the dish with cling film and chills it until service, and removes the cling film before service, would this be considered PPDS? I think the answer to that is no. Um, because you are removing the packaging before service um, and therefore it, it would be foods sold loose. Jess? I agree, yeah, it's not it's not enclosed anymore, is it? It's not in um, packaging. If it's if the cling film's been removed, it's yeah, it's not technically packed. We have one up here, Emma. I hope that's okay. I can read. Um, so, <laughs> so there's some examples of cakes and puddings which have been removed from their original packaging and sold by the portion or slice. The question there would be, that's fine. You can sell them, obviously, by the portion or slice, but it would all be, the question is whether or not you put it into any packaging as a portion or a slice before the person either orders it or selects it, and that will determine whether it becomes pre-packed for direct sale 
or whether it stays as foods sold loose. I think this sounds a little bit like your cake under the cover um, um, example, doesn't it, Barbara? So, yeah, yes. if, if it's under the, if it's, if they're just selecting a portion of that product and it is then taken away and packed after they've selected it, then no, that's, that's not PPDS. Okay, we've had some questions here, but I think apparently I've already answered them as we went through. So uh, sandwiches, pre-packed sandwiches, um, supplied to staff but not charged. Yes, they were covered under the new legislation and that yes, they would require full ingredients information because they don't have to be sold, they can be offered. I've also got another one um, as well that came through. What are the rules for aggregators like Deliveroo or Just Eat, etc.? Jess, do you want to answer this one? I, yeah, I can have a go. So as far as I'm aware, aggregators fall under distance selling. So they are not PPDS. So these rules would not apply to them. They need to be provided with the information that they can then provide to the customer, but they do not fall under the PPDS category. Is that what you would say, yeah. Barbara? Yeah, I absolutely would agree with that. Um, I think, again, yet another interesting area as we see the rise and rise of aggregators. Um, it seems to be a very common way now for people to uh, to be buying food. Um, somebody's asked the question of, can you tell me why is the size 10 centimetres squared so important? As I understand it, it's literally about the, the basically the size on which a label realistically could be applied. That's why. That's detailed on the FSA website for, for the person who's asked that specific question. And I guess to be able to accommodate the minimum font size so that it is yes. actually legible. Yes. Because obviously if you if you have tiny, tiny labels, <laughs> that might not be very helpful. No. So we have a question here. Um, in a canteen situation, a jelly pot with the lid removed is on display for sale. I believe this would not be PPDS as the contents can be altered. Is this the opinion of the panel? Yes, it absolutely is because the label, uh, the label, sorry, apologies, the top packaging has been removed. So it's not fully enclosed. Um, so it would not be PPDS, correct. Are there any more? I think, we are com I think we've come to the end of our questions for now, um, but of course, please, um, feel free to ask any further questions. Um, I've, I've left the um, information for Barbara and Jess up on the screen here. Um, so please, um, if you have any other questions, if you've managed to mull over anything that we've talked about today, uh, following the webinar, please do let us know. Um, and also please look out for a follow-up survey that should land in your inbox this afternoon. Uh, we would be grateful if you could complete this and let us know your thoughts. So thank you for your time. I hope you found it um, useful and informative um, and I hope you all have a great afternoon.